Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see so many of you uh, here for um, for our latest uh, webinar. Um, if this is your first time attending an Irish Wildlife Trust webinar, uh, my name is uh, Porrick. I am the campaign officer with the Irish Wildlife Trust. The Irish Wildlife Trust is a non-governmental organization. We're, we're a charitable uh, body and our purpose uh, is to raise awareness of the importance of nature to people. And we also campaign to try and uh, improve the lot of, uh, of wildlife uh, in Ireland. So um, if you enjoyed this webinar um, or you want to support the work that we do, please do consider joining uh, the Irish Wildlife Trust and um, you can go onto our website at iwt.ie, uh, where you'll find all the details uh, there. Um, now, what else do I have for you? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, um, this is the second uh, webinar in this season. Um, please do go on to our YouTube channel, where you will find uh, all of our previous webinars, uh, which we've been holding for the past uh, year and a half or so. And you find a great range of topics there and do like them and uh, interact with them. It helps with the visibility. Um, the webinar is being recorded um, as usual. So if uh, anyone you know missed it or whatever, um, do let them know that uh, they, can, they can watch it back. Um, now, before I introduce our guest for this evening, um, I'll just give you some housekeeping on the format. It's nearly just about seven o'clock now. Uh, we're going to run until about eight o'clock uh, this evening, so just about an hour or so. And um, if you have any questions uh, for Owen, please, you will find at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button. So uh, please put your questions into the Q&A button. By all means, uh, use the chat uh, to tell us where you're from or to chat amongst yourselves. But um, when, uh, when Owen has finished his presentation, um, I will be going to the Q&A button for any particular questions you might have uh, for him. So um, without further ado, I'm very excited uh, to uh, uh, invite um, Owen Dalton uh, to our webinar series. Uh, Owen is not a stranger to the Irish Wildlife Trust. I remember a few years ago uh, going to visit his amazing uh, woodland down on, on the Bear Peninsula. And uh, Owen is originally from, from Dublin, um, uh, but has moved down to this amazing little corner of, uh, of West Cork that, that he's going to tell us all about. And of course, Owen has published this amazing book uh, called An Irish Atlantic Rainforest. And um, it's been wonderful to see the amazing uh, reviews and the, the interactions that Owen has been getting online uh, for his new book. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Owen and you're very welcome Owen and thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, in your own time please. Thank you Parik. It's a real pleasure to, to be on with you. Um, so I guess I'll just, will I just talk about um, the book and what inspired the book and, and what the book is about? Sure, if you like. Uh, yeah, I know you have some photographs there. By all means, share your screen with us when you're when you're ready to do that as well. I will. Um, so, I, as you said, I'm from Dublin. Um, I'm I, I'm from around the Kilmaine and Minchicore area. Uh, and in 2009, I sold my house and bought a 73 acre farm on the Bear peninsula in west cork um the, the the farm was uh in it had been abandoned for quite a long time before i came so and that's really what attracted me to it because before some years before i moved down i suppose the idea had been floating around in my head for quite a number of years i wanted to do something like this and originally my plan was to to buy some land and and plant lots of native trees and watch them grow into a forest but as then i discovered the bear peninsula and i started focusing on that area with a with a view to looking for the right place and what i discovered was that any pieces of land that had been left unfarmed or unused for a period of time had had actually reverted naturally 
back to really rich natural habitat, including wild native forest. And this particular farm that I found near Iris on the northern side of the peninsula in 2008, I saw it first. That was exactly what had happened there. So the farm was, is, is, was and is 73 acres, uh, of which 40 acres, almost 40 acres is a share of mountain commonage. So very similar to most Irish uplands, just um, except very high amounts of rock. Um, but the rest of it is really just um, a type of grass, a very coarse grass called molinia, uh, or what they call down here, finon. Uh, so there's nothing really there of interest in ecological terms, but the, the actual, the rest of the farm that's not commonage was largely covered in the most beautiful uh, native forest. And that's what attracted me to the place. So I, I saw with my family, we sold our house in Dublin and moved here. Now, there was only a ruin on the on the, the land. The, the, the old farmhouse was completely ruined, that the, the roof had fallen in uh, many years before. So there was a kind of a big, um, a long process then started of trying to get planning permission. We were renting locally in the area while trying to get planning permission. And when, when that eventually came through, then actually building a new house alongside the old farmhouse. Uh, and also just getting to know the place. Um, and what I already knew before I bought it was that um, it was kind of, even though it was so beautiful and so rich in terms of the species diversity of the trees and the age of some of the trees and so on. Um, on the downside, it was in pretty bad ecological shape because what you had was you had a herd of feral goats in the area. So um, immediately, a couple of years before we came, I was told there were 100 feral goats in this group. And the forest that's on the farm that, that we bought was their kind of HQ, if you like. That was there. They, they were ranging out around the area a bit, but their central hangout was our place. So. The whole place was completely grazed to the bone um, and a lot of the trees were dead. So you had no natural regeneration of the trees whatsoever. Um, the, a lot of the trees had been killed through bark stripping by the, by the goats and there was no ground floor. So when, when we think of a native uh, forest in, in a place like Ireland, we associate a really rich uh, diversity of wildflowers and other flora um, and all of the other life that goes with that. But none of that was there. That was the, the, the whole floor of the forest was completely empty, apart from mosses and a few other less palatable plants. And what was hap what what the what what was also happening as a result of of this severe overgrazing was that it, it had opened um, the way it had created the conditions for the, the exact conditions that non-native invasive plant species like rhododendron find ideal for moving in and taking over. And that was exactly what was happening. There was rhododendron all over the land. In some places, it was quite old. Uh, elsewhere, there were plants of all different sizes coming up all over the place. So the first thing is, well, I'll just add to that, that um, what's important to understand here is that the, the forest as I found it in 2009 when we came was essentially in the, in the very same state as most of our uh, remnants of native forest are all over Ireland. So if you go to example for, to Killarney National Park or Glenvey National Park, or um, a multitude of other um, remnants of native forest, you'll find the vast majority of them are in exactly the same state, i.e. severely overgrazed. 
and being uh, taken over by um, non-native invasive plant species, the worst of which is, of course, rhododendron. But there, in our case, there were about seven or eight others as well as that, you know. So what I did was I applied for a scheme called the Native Woodland Scheme, which is um, it's a it's a it's a state-run scheme, but in difference to most of the other uh, forestry schemes, it's it's more um, it's more aimed towards biodiversity. Although timber production is a component of the scheme, but. And what I applied to, to have done was just that, they, that the scheme would fund uh, a fence to be erected around most of the land to fence out the goats. And there are sika deer in the area as well. So um, now that, that I applied for the scheme and it took, um, it took some time for that to work its way through for the process, or the application to work its way through. It took about a year and a half. In the meantime, in my spare time, I was getting rid of the rhododendron and the other invasive plant species. Um, then towards the end of the following year, uh, in 2010, the, um, the, the scheme, the native woodland scheme was approved and the, the uh, fence was erected around most of the land. And I continued in the meantime, getting rid of the rhododendron and so on. What I found as a result of what I was doing was over the following years, a really exciting uh, and spectacular explosion of life within the forest where, where native tree seedlings that have previously all been eaten as soon as they germinated, they, something would be along shortly to, to, to eat them uh, and that would be the end of it a little oak seedling or rowan or willow or whatever else they were all just being eaten um, but now they were able to start growing and so in areas where previously you just had grass so a lot of them started to rapidly turn into into forest um, now this process of colleges would call uh, from one very ecologically depleted state to a much more to a much richer state. Um, it 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 was happening everywhere across the land as soon as as soon as the the, the grazing uh, pressure was lifted, the whole every, the whole place started to transform, but at varying speeds. So it didn't happen at the same speed everywhere. Uh, and it's in some places, literally, as I say, where you had grass, only grasses within six, seven years, you didn't have just trees, but you actually had closed canopy woodland, young closed canopy woodland, but nonetheless. Um, and also on top of that, you, there was a, an eruption of wildflowers, a huge diversity of of scores of different species of wildflower that I had just imagined weren't there at all, you know, they, they just appeared. So they must have been there, but dormant. Um, so the likes of wood anemone, celandine, uh, bluebells, herb, herb robert, dog violet, and, and scores more, the whole place just came to life. And of course that, um, that encouraged all sorts of other uh, um, members of the, the of the woodland woodland inhabitants to come to life in, such as pollinators and other insects and bird life and the whole place just really really just came to life and it's been it's been so wonderful to see that um, and I guess like one of the things that really one of the most surprising parts of the whole thing was that you know in 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 the years after I moved down I really threw myself headlong into reading as much as I could about ecology um, and in particular woodland ecology I was um, that was anything relating to that I was particularly drawn to and it very quickly became clear to me that 
what I had uh, here in, in the Bear Peninsula wasn't just native forest, but it was very, very clearly actually rainforest. Um, and at first I had, I had difficulty in believing that, that such a thing could be actually true at all. But, um, you know, there was, there was absolutely all the, the signs were very, very clear. And the main sign of rain anywhere in the world, whether it's, whether it's tropical, what we have here was temperate rain forest, is the presence of what are called epiphytes. So these are plants, um, often ferns and mosses, but also flowering plants, and they can be a great variety, uh, that, that grow on trees without being rooted in the ground. So uh, when you talk about epiphytes, it doesn't include ivy and honeysuckle and so on. It has to be a plant that, that, that takes, that requires, that, that depends for all of its sustenance, uh, whether moisture or whatever else, on the air around or the, the, the substrate on which it's growing. So they're not, they're not parasitic plants in any way. They take nothing from the tree, uh, but they accept that they use it as, as, a, as a surface to go on. And so I was absolutely, you know, I was completely gobsmacked when I, when I started to realize that what I had here was actually rainforest. I had no idea that such a thing as rainforest existed in, in Europe, uh, never mind that I might actually have a small piece of it. Um, and then uh, when I started to look further into um, the whole subject of temperate rainforest, I discovered what was really quite an incredible coincidence, which is that my mom was originally from South Africa. She left when she was very young. She, she was involved in the anti-apartheid movement there in her teens and had to get out when she was only 19 at the end of the 1950s. But she was from a, a particular place in the Western Cape province called Nysna. And throughout my life, I, all, I, I, I was only ever there twice briefly when I was a child. Um, but I always heard my mom talking about Nysna and, and the forests. Uh, the Nysna forests are quite famous. They're the, 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 the most extensive tract of uh, natural forest in Southern Africa. Um, and they also happen to be temperate rainforest. So when I discovered this, uh, I said, right, I have to go over. It was 33 years since I'd been to South Africa. And I said, I'm going to go over there and um, get to know these forests ecologically, explore them um, as a way of as a way of understanding my own place better. I mean, I had a, a, a great desire to see the forest, but I also had a, had a feeling that by, by gaining an acquaintance with forests that would have something in, have, have things in, in common with my own forest here in Ireland, but have different, be different in other ways, that it would, it would kind of show, throw into relief um, what makes, uh, a forest here particularly special and that's exactly what happened so I spent I, I went over and I spent a month uh, exploring a string of pieces of temperate and subtropical rainforests all the way from Cape Town up until up nearly as far as Mozambique um, and they were absolutely amazing um, but one of the one of the funny things about it really was that before I went, I had this real fear um, that that going over and seeing the forests in South Africa would be so amazing that I'd come back here and I'd I'd never really be able to enjoy the forest here to the same extent because you know what we have here now in Ireland, what's left is really just little tiny handkerchiefs um, of of habitat, whereas in South Africa and other parts of the world. You know, there are places where you can forest the Nisna forests, you can get lost in them, and people sometimes do, and they're never found again. Uh, and some of the trees are literally, you know, 
five or six meters across at the base, really ancient, and they're inhabited by fauna like leopards and elephants and baboons. Um, so I had this real fear that it would be so amazing that I'd come home and, and I'd go, well, this is nice, but it's, you know, compared to what I've seen, it's, it's actually not such a big deal. But it actually had the opposite effect because despite how amazing the, the, the forests over there that I explored were, they made me appreciate so much more what makes our, our own native forests here in Ireland so, so very special. Um, and in, in my book, An Irish Atlantic Rainforest, I, I describe that as being, I suppose you could, you could um, the, the, the best way to, to describe that is the, in terms of the dynamism that I saw that I see in the forests here on a on a on a regular basis, and that's down to a whole range of of factors. Um, first off, there's the seasonality. So, you while while what we have here are temperate rainforests, and what they have in in Nisner are temperate rainforests, they're actually different types of ten, temperate rainforests because. The temperate zones, there are actually two uh, subcategories. There's cool temperate and there's warm temperate. And what we have here is cool temperate. What they have there is warm temperate. So what that means is that the seasons there are much less um, um, clear. So you don't have uh, the what we have here of a, of a kind of a distinct winter and spring and, and summer and autumn it's 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 more um it's less the 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 weather changes less in terms of temperature and all the rest of it over there so the result of that is that you don't have this uh continual change of the forest environment over there uh the way you do here so you don't have this thing of you know the the, the explosion of wildflowers that occurs on on the woodland floor in the spring and the early summer, and then the, 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 the opening of the canopy above, uh, followed by the, the eruption of a whole host of different types of fungi everywhere in, in the autumn, and the, the fall of the leaves. And, you know, you've got this, this continual change here in the forest that's based on the seasons. But also beyond that, in my own, in my own place, I think, this, the storms that we get here um, have a lot to do with it because the storms in, in a place like the Bear Peninsula really have to be experienced to be believed. Do you know, there it was, <laughs> it took me, it took me a few years to get used to them. They really are out of this world. You know, the, you think that the whole world is, is coming to an end the first time you really experience one of these things properly. Um, and the effect of that is to, that you, you get a lot of trees getting knocked down and branches blown off and all, so, all sorts of damage, uh, quote unquote, damage to the forest. But that kind of disturbance is actually extremely beneficial in ecological terms because it, it opens up gaps in the canopy for light to come in and um, Above all, it's just you've got it, it makes the, the environment extremely dynamic and um, and it's and that's all good for all of the things that live there, you know. So, I mean, I could keep talking uh, nonstop for as long as you like, but I mean, I, I guess that you might have some questions or you might like to direct my conversation in a particular way. Um, uh, yeah, we have questions. Did you want to show us uh, your photographs? Yeah, sorry, I completely forgot. Um, right, so I'm going to show you a picture first off of um, the view from, so I, as I said, um, the, uh, the, can you see that now? Yes, there it is, yeah. 
So that's the view from the, the first top, as the neighbours call it, of the mountain commonage. So uh, the commonage um, is the mountain beside, be, near, near um, the, the, private, the, 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 the unshared part of the farm. And it, it goes up to, to a kind of, there's a, there's a first ridge and then you can, there's a small valley behind that. And then it continues up to what the neighbors call the high top. So that's the view from the first top. And you can see there that the, the, it's a bit of a hazy day in that picture, but um, you can see that the main island there that you can see is Inish Farnard and that's part of the Bear Peninsula, that's County Cork, but beyond that, just a bit to the right is our Danish and Scarif. And there at the end of the Ivara Peninsula, which is the next peninsula up, and it's part of County Kerry. And in the haze to, to the right of those, you can possibly just about make out the Skelligs. Um, now, often they're much clearer than that. This is this is obviously there was high humidity on that particular day, but it gives you an idea of. of the um, of the beauty of the of the area. Uh, I just I've really just absolutely fell in love with the place from the moment I laid eyes on it. Um, and I'll, I'll show you now a photograph of of within the forest. If oh, oh hold on, um, if you can see that now, that's that's within the forest. Yeah, looks great. So on in that photograph, um, that's that's one that's a, an oak growing at the the edge of. There's actually a, a, a severe a, a steep drop there. You can't see it, but it, it's about five or six, well five meters high, I'd say. Um, and you can probably just about make out uh, some of the epiphytes growing and the epiphytic ferns growing on on some of the branches. Maybe not, but we'll, we'll I have other photographs anyway. Um, but you know, as soon as as soon as I saw uh, sites like that, I just I was in love with the place from 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 first meeting. Really, I knew straight away that this is where I wanted to be. Um, I'm going to show you another photograph here now. Of this is this is not my place. This is Killarney National Park, but it gives you an idea of the the state. That our place was in when we arrived, in terms of the absolute uh, bareness of the woodland floor. Now, that photograph, to be totally fair, was taken in the winter or maybe the the spring. So, the the leaves are gone off most of the trees as well, uh, which may be slightly unfair. But if you just if you look at the the woodland floor uh, and what's there, there's literally. The only thing that that exists there, apart from mosses, is a single rhododendron seedling coming up, and that gives you some idea of what it's like. Um, so I'll maybe and and here's here's um, the this this is now uh, an image of the guilty party. The these. These were the feral goats, uh, some of the feral goats, and the first bear um, that were then fenced out. So when they were fenced out, uh, the place started to, oh, I'm sorry, here's, here's a photograph of just up the coast from me, a place called Lorock in County Kerry, and it shows rhododendron that's really taken a hold. So. You've got old oaks uh, growing up, um, but now their complete lower reaches are completely submerged in a sea of rhododendron. Um, and no light gets through, or virtually no light gets through that, that um, can of rhododendron. So the, nothing grows underneath apart from a couple of mosses and stuff. Um, so, so the trees can't regenerate um, and there's no ground floor or anything else. And as the trees age and die, you'll end up with a situation where you've only got what it is. And that, that is tragically the, the site that greets you when you visit so many 
of our tiny uh, remaining fragments of Irish land. It's, it's just desperately sad that this is what you see in, in, in combination with um, this, i.e. severe overgrazing uh, and, and total takeover by rhododendron and other plants. So once the, um, once the goats and the deer were fenced out, this is what you started to see happening. Um, you started to see a huge, um, a real transformation. What you're looking at here would, would previously have just been grass. Um, but you can see there's a, there's a great variety of different trees there now. There's, there's oak on the right. You've got birch um, and sally and hill. And I know you probably can't make it out, but I know that one of those trees is also wild apple. And what is nothing here was planted. These are all trees that self-seeded themselves into the ground. Uh, so what you're looking at here is the spontaneous formation of wild native rainforest, really. Uh, I honestly say there's nothing, I, can, I, I struggle to think of anything that I think is as exciting as witnessing this process of transformation. Um, this is um, a part of the, 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 the forest now, the old, one of the older bits of the forest. And you can see in front, you've got a whole, um, a, a, um, a kind of a of plant called bugle, a juga reptans. Uh, that, that particular uh, woodland flower likes wetter areas, so that area is quite wet. Now, again, if you compare that to what was there before, there was nothing there from about chest or head height down. There was, there was no growth whatsoever. All you had were, was moss-covered rocks and tree trunks, and that was it, really. So an amazing metamorphosis. There's one of my favorite woodland flowers, that, that, that's, that's wood anemone. And I love the, the, the brightness of it and the shape of it. It's such a cheerful flower. But what I also really like about it is the fact that it seems to be um, very clearly uh, associated with the other part of the forest. So it's, it's, it seems to be, uh, in, in my case, an ancient woodland indicator. It, it, it indicates the older parts of the forest. So what I, um, in the, in the years after buying the place, talking to neighbors and doing some kind of detective work and doing a bit of research, which is all in my book, um, I discovered what had happened to, to the farm and, and how, how it had gone from being a regular farm into a piece of, of wild forest. And what had happened was that the, the family that lived on the farm in the past, the Crowley family, they had mostly emigrated to the United States in the early parts of the 20th century. So while there was one or two people left behind um, up until about maybe 1980, they really didn't do much with the land. So I think if you were able to travel back in time to around 1900, on, um, on ordnance survey maps, there's no indication uh, of any woodland from, from the 1840s or from around 1900. But I think if you went back in time, what you would have found would, would have been uh, pockets, small pockets of native trees here and there, um, particularly in the really rough parts, because the land here is very rough. So you, it's, it's topographically, it's very uneven with, you know, cliffs um, and kind of deep gorges and scree and it's very, very uneven and very rough. And in the rougher areas, you would have had bunches of trees that were just left there because the land wasn't considered worth 
doing anything with agriculturally. And you still see the same thing in neighboring farms now. Do you know, the, the, the same scenario still presents itself of, of, you know, rougher bits of land are covered in trees. And then the flatter bits in between are grazed by sheep or cows or whatever. And then you have also have trees along field boundaries, whether hedgerows or lone trees. And in my place, it's you, you see the same thing, but with uh, around a century of, of uh, succession uh, imposed over that. So there are the older areas, the, the areas of older woodland tend to be in bits of rougher ground. And the, the more recently established woodland are in the flatter bits in between. And this particular flower, wood anemone, is very closely associated with the older parts of forest. Uh, and I've, that, uh, I've had a couple of people who are knowledgeable in these things tell me that some of the older trees probably date back to the 17th century, which is really, you know, wonderful to, to imagine that some of them would have been growing there back in the 1600s, possibly. Yeah. Here's, here's an example. That's a, a, a broad buckler fern growing as, a, as an epiphyte from a, a pocket of collected um, hummus in, in a tree. So that's, that's, a, a, that's an unusual example of, of an epiphyte. Usually epiphytic ferns tend to be the likes of polypody fern. Um, but it, that gives you an idea. If a, a, a fern like that can only grow in a place where you get high levels uh, of rainfall or other types of moisture arriving on a frequent basis. Otherwise, it just it, it, because it's not rooted in the ground, it wouldn't be able to survive. And that's what that's what tells you that, that it's rainforest. This is a river flowing through one of one of the Nisna forests uh, that I explored where my mom was. Uh, you can see my binoculars and little rucksack there on the rock beside. Um, and it gives you an idea. Uh, the forests, you can see the similarities, all of the ferns and so on. They have tree ferns there as well. Um, but most of the trees are non-deciduous. They don't, they don't lose their leaves seasonally the way most of ours do. So important differences too. But extremely beautiful places. I mean, they, they, they left a, a real mark on me, those, those forests. Here's um, going back to my place in, in the spring. So you can see that the leaves still haven't opened properly on the trees. The, the leaves that you can see there are that's ivy growing up that oak. Uh, and the um, it's there's bluebells everywhere, plus a, a, a fantastic diversity of ferns and other flora. Um, so an extremely rich habitat. Here's um, a view down over the canopy of our forest down towards the sea in mist. So you can just about make out the coastline there, which is a little bit lit up by uh, a, a shaft of, of sunlight through the mist. And those are exactly the, the kind of conditions that temperate rainforests just absolutely thrive in. Um, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that gives rise to, to your epiphytes is that really high levels of, of aerial humidity. And that the, just on the immediate left there, you can see some, some leaves uh, belonging to a tree. And that's Arbutus unedo, that's strawberry tree, which is one of our um, Lusitanian species. And that, um, that's a tree that wasn't actually in the forest when I arrived. There, there weren't any there, although there's one very nearby, just in a neighboring farm, a wild one. But I took, I took a few cuttings from wild arbutus and I grew them, um, I, I, I planted them and 
got them to develop roots and planted them out and about a half a dozen survived and, and most of them have done very well. Some of them are, are reasonably big now. There's a, 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 if I remember rightly, that's a dragonfly, that's the species name and that's in a in in a woodland glade, uh, one of the open areas within more open areas within the woods. Uh, so you've got a, a fantastic um, biological diver diversity within the woods now, um, and along with the the things, the, all of the the uh, the fauna and the flora that was there, uh, you've had some things move in in over just the last few years, including pine martens and otters and lesser horseshoe bats um, and barn owls as evidence of barn owls. So really the whole place is coming to life ecologically in so many ways. And it's just been such a wonderful um, experience to, to, to witness all of that and to, to see it happen and to be a part of it really. Now, this is... Um, this is the ruins of a, a cabin, an old stone cabin within the woods. And this is, I guess, the, the, the tragic and the sad side of, of the whole picture, which is that the, um, the area was absolutely devastated by the farm. So the, the, the farm is, uh, it, there's, there's, it's in two townlands. Now, the first one is, is called Boffical, which comes from um, Recess of the Wild Wood in Irish. And the other one is Fawcett, which comes from Sloping Wood. And the population of, of Boffical uh, collapsed by over 50% during the famine. And the population of Fawcett, um crashed by almost 75%. So really, you know, I mean, that's that's the 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 difficult side of all of this really is that it was people leaving that paved the way for the forest to start returning to some degree. Um, and one of the things I try to that I'm particularly interested in 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 the book that I wrote is I think we we really need to find a way of overcoming that dynamic in which either people or nature do well and finding a new one in which both can thrive together. Um, but the other side of that is that, you know, as I've shown with the, the naturally regenerating trees and forest, this forest didn't come into existence through anybody deciding, let's have a forest or let's plant trees or let's make this. It happened because it was left alone. And I think there's a really important lesson in there for those of us who are who want to be bringing back wild nature is that very often the best thing we can do for nature is to just step out of the way and let nature do it by itself. There's a view down onto the woodland canopy from above. That's that photograph taken from Crowley's Curacon, which is a Curacon is um, a lot of a lot of um, Irish words are still used in the area. So, you know, people people sprinkle their speech still with Irish, um, and a Curacon is like a kind of a small hill. Um, and Crowley's Curacon is obviously part of our our farm. It's a it's a piece of you know, it's a kind of a rocky outcrop that sticks up through the forest uh, and looks down on the canopy. Uh, and that's the view. And you can see there's a, an old oak snag there as well, which is another word for a dead standing tree, all of which is extremely valuable for all sorts of wildlife, particularly what are called saproxylic species, which are any species that require dead wood as part of their life cycle. That's our collie dog, Charlie. He's up on top of, um, this is on the far side of the road now. So this isn't, this is part of our place. It's not common, it's up above the road. So it's not inside the fence that was um, uh, erected um, under the native woodland scheme. 
And up in this area, I'm, I'm doing something slightly different. So I consider what I'm doing on the other side of the road as rewilding. Whereas here, I'm practicing high nature value farming. So I have Dexter cattle. I used to have sheep, which spent most of their time on the commonage. Um, I never liked them. I never got on with them. Um, and I think the reason why was that I was aware of what an ecological disaster sheep are uh, and how that conflicted everything else I was trying to do. So even though the sheep were on the commonage nearly the whole time, it just, I was aware that there was something a bit uh, contradictory in having them at all. Um, and that together with other factors in the end, uh, about two and a half years ago, I got rid of them, I sold them all off, and I got a few Dexter cattle instead. And Dexters are a breed that were originally uh, from southwest of Ireland, and they are really hardy and well adapted to rough ground. And they, they also still spend most of their time on the mountain commonage. But I bring them in in the winter into our own place. Uh, and I find that that's actually ecologically quite beneficial. It works in terms of the ecology because they create a certain amount of disturbance. And because the leaves are off the trees in the winter, they don't in any way impede or, or uh, act as an obstacle to the natural regeneration of trees and other important flora. Uh, and their dung being organic, their dung is great for invertebrates and all sorts of other stuff. So that area, you can just about make out lower down underneath the rocks there. You can see a lot of birches and sallies uh, and various other uh, native wild trees coming up. And that photograph was taken several years ago, so it's far more developed now. Uh, and I think give it another, you know, few years or maybe a bit less than a decade, and that will all be wild native forest. This is a tree creeper, one of my favorite uh, woodland inhabitants. They, they're a woodland specialist bird species, and they feed by going in spiral up, up uh, uh, the trunk of a tree and picking out uh, small invertebrates with, with their kind of thin curved beak which you can see there and they're really gorgeous when they when they get to a certain height in the tree they go up as I said in a spiral and when they get to a certain height they fly down to the base of another tree and start over and they kind of work their way through the forest in that fashion and I love them I mean they're a little bit inspirous, but I think they're great characters they're like they're kind of like little mini woodpeckers in some in some respects in terms of you know, they're, they're some of their characteristics. Um, can you see this now? This is, or maybe a better. Um, can you see this now? This is the, the uh, photograph of the mountain commonage. Is that, is that coming up? Yeah, we see it, yeah. So that's one of the very few trees. That's a, a hawthorn or a white thorn as, as they're called down here. Um, one of the very, one of the only trees you'll find anywhere on the mountain manage uh, that somehow managed to get away before it was completely eaten to death by sheep. Uh, and it gives you an idea of how rough the ground is up there. It's, in, it's incredibly rough. Um, and every time I go up there, particularly in the spring, I'll always find seedlings of native trees popping up here and there, particularly round, but also birch and sally and even the odd oak and holly. Uh, but of course, you know, the next time you come back a month later and they're gone because each, each seedling is only going to be uh, a mouthful for a sheep uh, and they, they just get eaten. So that the, the, the constant grazing keeps places like this in a state of arrested development. They're, they're kept bare by the, the constant. That was taken away. 
these these places just as my own place uh down below whether within the the, the deer fence or where i'm doing the high nature value farming the the mountain commonage would go back to to native woodland in exactly the same way here's here's a picture of again of uh up near the commonage this is our place and you can see on the top left, you can see a fence there on the horizon. That's a sheep fence. So on the far side of that fence is the mountain commonage. But that gives you an idea. So the only trees that were there in that picture maybe 10 years ago was the, the, the very windswept birch on the, at the top left and the larger oak on the right-hand side. So all of the smaller trees that are coming up all around those have have grown up within the last five or six years. There's been, uh, you, you're, you're again, this is going to be a native forest, closed canopy forest within quite within quite a short space of time. There's a photograph from within the 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 the, the thickest part of the forest down where the the deer fence is, and that gives you an idea of how rich and how lush and green these places are. They're really, you know, I mean, it, it still amazes me to think that we have habitats as rich as this, and yet we allow them to remain completely and utterly trashed on the, in the main, you know, it's, I struggle to think, to think of any piece of uh, rainforest in Ireland that's in good condition outside of my place. And I'm sure I'm sure there are bits that exist, but I, I think you're talking about, you know, virtually zilch in terms of land area. Uh, Owen. Yeah. I might stop you there on that uh, yeah. that lovely picture. And um just conscious of of time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, sure. but and I would like to leave some time for questions if that's okay. Yeah. Um so um and if you don't mind, I have a question of my own, really. I mean, what, what you've done is, is remarkable, and I think it has opened a lot of people's eyes to, you know, Ireland's native ecology, as opposed to what we've been looking at on the front of postcards all of our lives. Um, but I'm wondering, how have your neighbours uh, taken to, to this? Because it is, uh, it is totally opposite to how we've been brought up to look at land and what land is for and what we should be doing with it. And you're doing exactly the opposite and everyone is cheering you on. I mean, how does that um, make them feel? Well, I think it's a really good question because often the, the ecology in my experience is, is pretty straightforward. You know, you, you, you get rid of the overgrazing and the invasive plant species and then you just let it get on with it. The, the difficulty can be in, in, in not having what you're doing perceived by the local community in a hostile way, because I think that can be, that can, there's, there's a real serious risk that that could come back uh, and have very negative effects on what you're trying to do. And it's unpleasant as well, because if you live in a community, you don't want to have that. But what I'd say is, and I, and I can only really speak about my own experience, which may or may not be applicable elsewhere, but in here, um, I think once people understood that I was doing my thing in my own place, and I wasn't trying to force anything on anybody else, so I wasn't coming down from Dublin with, with a kind of an agenda of, oh, I know, I, I'm... I know lots of stuff that you don't know, and here's this is what's right, and you're all wrong, and the way you've been doing things for all of these years is all wrong. I never, I, I was always, I mean, I think it would have, apart from being highly counterproductive to have that kind of an attitude, I think it would be, you know, just kind of awful anyway, because I think you need you need to have a bit of humility in what you do. And that has served me well because I've learned so much from neighbours in terms of the history and the culture and the oral traditions of it that would probably, I wouldn't have if I had had a kind of, if I had had the wrong attitude. So 
what I'd say is that here in the Bear Peninsula, there's an attitude that if, if, if you're doing your own thing, but you're not bothering anybody else, and generally speaking, you're a good neighbor, then they'll just let, leave you get on with it. I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody really would want to, to, do, to do what I'm doing themselves. Um, and certainly not because there's no money in it. There's, the, what I'm doing wouldn't, if, if for, for any other farmers, thing would mean essentially giving up uh, their livelihood from the land, from a lot of the land. And why would they do that? Uh, it would make no sense. So I wouldn't expect them to want to do the same thing, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't really had any hostile or I haven't really had any negativity, negativity towards what I'm doing. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, um, and I have one other question before I go on to some of the questions from, uh, from the panelists. Um, you talk about your, your kind of uh, epiphany where you discover that what you have is uh, temperate rainforest. And um, certainly I think for me, it was also a revelation that, that temperate rainforest is a thing because it is such an evocative word. But do we know uh, in Ireland how much of the country would be temperate rainforest if you know, lots of people were to do what you were doing. I see there's areas in the UK, uh, you know, but would all of Ireland be temperate rainforest, do you think? If, uh, well, again, I think that's a really good question, uh, Porik. And what I, my own view of that is that, well, there's a couple of answers I'd give to it. The first is that I don't think it's, the, you know, it's, I think it would be incorrect to, to have an idea that there's, you've got temperate rainforest and then you've got native forest that's not temperate rainforest and no kind of gray areas in between because there, there would be all sorts of gradations uh, in terms of degree of moisture and rainfall and area of humidity and all the uh, variations in terms of you know, from, from one extreme to another. So I think the first problem you'd have in answering a question like that, even if Ireland still was covered in that native forest, is you'd have, you'd struggle to find your cutoff point between what's rainforest and what's not, if that makes sense. The, 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 the second thing I'd say to it is that, the second answer I'd give is that if you, if you look at a tree, for example, growing in Tipperary on a, along the, the, the margins of a field, uh, the chances are it won't have epiphytes. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't have temperate rainforest there because when, when you have a natural forest growing uh, uh, rather than, as opposed to kind of like clumps of trees or the odd lone tree here or there or a hedgerow or whatever, forests create their own conditions, their own kind of microclimates, and they, they keep the, the land much more humid and moist. Uh, and they actually, in my experience, they regulate their own microclimates, um, which would make, make areas that possibly have lower levels of rainfall because they'd be, they would retain uh, much higher amounts of the, the, the moisture that, that, that does arrive, that those could actually be rainforest too. So I, I really don't know, but I think, it, I think a lot of Ireland, maybe, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out hit there, maybe two thirds of Ireland, or maybe two thirds of Ireland's forest would be rainforest of some sort. Mm -hmm. It'd be wonderful to, uh, to find out. Um, sure. Now, a lot of comments uh, are coming in about the role of grazing. And uh, you have excluded grazing completely uh, from your area. Um, uh, some well, people are asking that's, that's, about the I, role yeah, of yeah. Uh, cattle. And as we see from uh, some sites in the UK, the likes of NEP, for instance, where they have free roaming cattle and, and horses and so on, you get a wood pasture. And uh, Richard is also asking in particular, um, 
about uh, the profusion of brambles uh, in a forest, and he's he's wondering does the uh, do, does the, the lack of grazing not allow brambles that kind of thorny shrub to take over and uh, shade out the trees, trying to uh, trying to naturally regenerate. Well, one of the very few things I do moving invasive species when I find them is that I do uh, sometimes cut back briars or brambles because although they're an incredibly important plant for native wildlife, both the flowers and the fruit and the cover they provide, they can take over in the absence, complete absence of grazing. That's the one thing that I do do is that I sometimes uh, I, I have a tool called the bill hook and I sometimes cut a few briars back because um, I mean, I think I think that, that it wouldn't be such a problem in terms of the trees if you had briars everywhere, because the trees do tend to grow up through them within the forested areas in the more open areas, perhaps less so. Um, but it would it would I think it would reduce ground ground flora and it would make the place very difficult to walk through. And I see as one of the main purposes of my place is to act as a kind of a, is to showcase what forests can be. Um, so I'll just, I'll just go forward. There's, for example, if that's coming up, that's Alan Watson Featherstone who visited the forest um, a few months back. And I've had a steady stream of people like him and yourself coming to visit. Um, and I need to be able to show people what a forest can be and if the whole place was overgrown with brambles you you would that would be impossible but i think you know um like if you were doing this on a on a much bigger scale you wouldn't need to worry about the briars and brambles so much because it wouldn't really matter um they i don't think it would be a problem in terms of the the regeneration of the 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 the, the trees or other flora or, or most of the other flora i don't think it would be an issue i think what's, what's essential to to say here is that what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to recreate a, a situation as um that's as conducive as possible to, to biodiversity and nature but within a context that's wholly artificial. So my two choices really are to fence out grazers altogether or to just let um, Sika uh, come back in and bring it back to the, the completely overgrazed state that it was in before. And given those choices, the best one is to fence them out. But having a complete absence of grazing is, of course, completely unnatural as well. Uh, it's as unnatural as having a, an artificially high density of grazers due to the fact that there are no more uh, predators to regulate their numbers or behavior. So really, I suppose to, to condense all that down, you know, you're you're really you're kind of acting within within the ground of what's possible in a in a completely artificial non natural context, kind of completely dysfunctional wider landscape. Yeah, and what about uh, cattle? What's your view of uh, having cattle in forests like this? Yeah. I got the cat, uh, sorry, I got it and got cattle instead because cat graze in a much more benign way than sheep. Uh, sheep uh, graze very selectively. So you put sheep into a, a piece of ground where you've got native trees, small native trees coming up naturally everywhere. Even if there's loads of other stuff to eat, even if there's loads of grass and all the rest of it, the first thing they're going to eat will be the trees um, because they're they're uh, particularly nutritious and therefore much more tasty. So they'll eat those out first and foremost, which is of course highly damaging and highly effective in, in preventing natural succession of to woodland. Cattle on the other hand tends to just kind of, they, they don't know that what they eat, they, they wrap their tongue around a whole bunch of stuff and just yank it out. 
So they will eat um, trees as well, but kind of along with everything else, rather than just fo just zeroing in on the trees specifically. Um, now you said that grazing is completely excluded from, from my own place. And that's not entirely true. So they're brought in in the winter when, when the leaves are off the trees. So the area where Alan is standing there now, that had my cattle ranging through it last winter for about four weeks. And I have to say that the results were positive. And I noticed um, increased numbers of wildflowers the following spring, I think, I'm not completely sure what I put that down to. Maybe this, the disturbance of their hooves. Maybe they were eating some of the ivy that might have been starting to kind of take over in, on the ground ivy. Um, but so I think, you know, cattle can be really ecologically beneficial. Uh, and of course, large animals moving through ecosystems like the natural process, it's, it's, an, it's something that would have been part of any woodland ecosystem in the past, uh, animals much bigger than cattle, in fact. But what I would also say is that I'm only able to do this because I have the natural or I have the, the mountain commonage where the cattle can go for most of the year, which serves as a kind of a sacrificial zone because there's nothing there. You know, there's no there's no biological diversity on the commonage. And being able to bring the cattle in for a couple of months and and have them um, their beneficial effects is only possible because there's somewhere else where they can go for most of the year that remains completely and utterly trashed. Yes, um, I mean it's all very interesting. I mean you can see how your your it's not complete a uh, hands off approach you're taking. Then you are kind of. Uh, tweaking here and there and, and, and learning new things also. Um, I'm conscious of the time, Owen, and we've run over a little bit, but I, I, want, I want to leave uh, maybe on, on a particular note and I'm encapsulating a couple of the questions here that have come through um, about uh, grants, whether the grants are good enough uh, under the Native Woodland Scheme, but in particular, how do you think we can incentivize the kind of thing you have done on a much greater scale. There's, there's one thing that we absolutely need to do. The native woodland scheme are not going to be attractive to most farmers because they only last for seven years. They're not very high, and there's a there's a limit on them of seven years beyond which your your land is basically you 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 earn nothing for it. So a farmer is not going to give up a an annual income for that. Um, what we need to do is. If we want to see nature and, and wild natural habitats coming back on a big scale in Ireland, the, the one thing that needs to be changed is the farm payments subsidies um, criteria. And we need to make rewilding, i.e. not farming of land, an option for farmers. That Now, I, I hasten to add that nothing should be forced on farmers nothing should be mandatory it should be just purely another choice it should be left entirely up to farmers to decide what they want to do with land uh, but it should be um, farmers it has to be made a viable financial option to farmers to be able to to live on the land while rewilding it that's that's the one thing uh, that's absolutely essential Yes, uh, and I, I think um, I do agree with you. I think the, uh, the subsidies and the policies are so important at the end of the day. Um, I think there is some good news coming uh, from next year. A farmer will be allowed to rewild half of their land uh, without losing uh, any of their farm payments. This was uh, an awful. Yeah, I'm not there. sure. I'm not sure that I call. I mean, I haven't studied probably the detail as much as you may have, Porik, but. I'm not sure that I would call that rewilding half their farm. I think they're allowed to have scrub or other previously ineligible features now included uh, for payments. But when I talk about rewilding, I'm talking about 
you know, I mean, I, I would guess that they would still have to have animals ranging through that uh, scrub and so on. I mean, if, if they fenced off that land and didn't use it at all um, for, for farming, um, then I wonder would it still be allowed? Um, but beyond that, um, really, it needs to be applied to whole farms. Farm, farmers should have need to have the option of not farming all of their land if that's what they wish to do, you know, um, and just completely uh, producing natural habitat, really, instead of food or, or a bit of both. If, but it needs to be entirely up to them and they need to have those choices. And I think if they did, there'd be plenty of farmers who would say, um, sheep is part of my thing. I like having sheep or cattle or whatever else it is. And I'm, I want to carry on doing that. But there'd be others, uh, like in a place like the Bear Peninsula, there's nobody down here who lives purely from farming. Everybody has to have some other income because otherwise it just it just doesn't work. You can't live from farming alone. So if you're if you're living as whatever, you're you've got another sideline, and then you're having to spend your weekends running after sheep on the mountains. There would be a proportion who'd say, "Well, no, you know, I'll just I'll just leave that to rewild, and I'll go up there whenever I need to to remove invasive species like rhododendron, or make sure it's not being overgrazed by deer or whatever. But otherwise, I can just leave it alone, and I can still depend on that income uh, in the same way. And I think there would be a proportion who would opt for that, and we need to we may, we need to make that a possibility for them." Otherwise, nature is, is going to continue to, to die off in Ireland, which, which is exactly what we're seeing happen right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so lots of food for thought there. And um, thanks for, for staying with us, even though we went a little bit over time. Um, and thank you so much uh, for, for your time this evening. And uh, there is sure. Owen's book again. And... Uh, get a copy of it, have a read. It's a wonderful book. Um, you can also follow Owen on Twitter, where he's very active and gets a lot of interactions. And it's wonderful to follow that as well. He's at Irish Rainforest uh, on Twitter. So thank you very much to everyone at home also for tuning in. It's great to see so many of you uh, who are interested uh, in this uh, topic. Uh, as I say, it has been recorded, it will be available online, we'll put it on our YouTube channel uh, later in the week, and uh, do check out a lot of the other uh, webinars that are also on our YouTube channel, and um, don't forget to join the Irish Wildlife Trust, uh, because your support is badly needed uh, in the work that we do in trying to promote rewilding and the restoration of nature and addressing the biodiversity crisis across land and sea in Ireland. So thanks again, Owen. Thanks again, everyone at home. Thanks, Good night, Mark. and I'll see you uh, in November next time for our next webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.